So this coronavirus is now rampant in the U.S. And so it always starts off like this. In the beginning, there's like a low number that they report. It starts off where it may be one or two people or it's under 40 people. Um, it's like a low number is how it starts off. And then all of a sudden the number just shoots up and it explodes into the hundreds. And then the hundreds within less than a week into the th- well into the thousands of individuals that are cases that are reported and then the death toll starts to begin to grow. And so it just seems like it creeps up, you know, it just, it goes in clusters. And a lot of times what I've noticed is that when they report this, it's like in places where people, they have a lack of healthcare workers and resources or they're low on supplies when it comes to like medicine or they don't have enough people that are really there to do all of the testing for each individual or they have people that they tested and then the tests come back as the person doesn't have symptoms of the virus and then later it shows that the person has symptoms of the virus. I've been hearing those stories. So in the beginning, President Trump was saying that nobody in the U.S. has died of coronavirus. Well, now he is changing that tone of voice because we have the first U.S. now is upping the travel restrictions as Trump says more coronavirus cases are likely. The reason why is because up here up top in the red, I don't know if you can see it, there's a live video where the White House gives an update on the coronavirus after the first U.S. death is now reported from that virus. And so a lot of people are not really feeling like this is a real thing because I've been hearing a lot of conflicting stories. Some people have been saying that people have been using this as a hoax um, or they've been uh, ex- over-exaggerating the story, or it really targets people that are much older, like over the age of 60 and, and older. And so a lot of their information is not altogether correct. And it, it looks as though that they're getting bits and pieces of some information. And I think a lot of it is is still based on fear you know when some people are afraid of something that could possibly be true they try to find excuses to not believe it oh it's a hoax oh it only it only harms people who have health issues that are pre-existing oh it only targets people who are elderly and so that pretty much puts them in a position where they feel some sense of security when they really aren't underneath secure about this virus because they don't have all of the facts or the information correct as to how easily it spreads and how true this really is because they haven't actually seen anybody that they are close to or people in their family or somebody that they know that might be famous or somebody that they can say that they know has actually experienced this virus yet because it isn't yet all the way in the U.S. like what people would assume it is. That's the assumption they're getting. Well, it isn't all the way in the U.S. It isn't really affecting that many people or not that many people have have succumbed to this. This is a hoax or it's a political hoax. Um, So we've had issues that have happened in the past where people have put a lot of effort into creating these um, conspiracy theories that real live incidences and things that are happening in real time turn up to be, they, they claim hoaxes when they really aren't hoaxes. It really is a shooting. It really is a mass murder. It really is a virus that is, is spreading. It just is taking its course. And so it, once it reaches the U.S. and then you start having numbers 
uh, multiply of people that are being affected by it, then it becomes more reality for people. And then they realize what they thought was a hoax isn't a hoax or what they thought only affects older individuals and people who are already having health issues. That's not always the case. It can affect people who are younger. It can affect people who don't have pre-existing health issues. It can affect people in a lot of uh, uh, backgrounds um, from all walks of life. And so it has spread all over globally. And a lot of people want to treat this as an epidemic. They want to say it's an epidemic. And I believe that reason why they're doing that is they're careful to say that and call that an epidemic when it really is a pandemic because it has spread really rapidly and it's spread around the uh, different countries and it's just continuously spreading and there has been deaths and it actually has surpassed SARS in terms of the death tolls and so the numbers that people are being told are not really correct either so there's a lot of doubt as to the the numbers of people that have actually died from this virus and um, from what I realize is that it could be a lot more people dying but they're not really saying because they're careful to say um, oh uh, epidemic uh, oh it's only one person that is affected by it oh it's it's you know it's it's really not something that we can do anything about you just have to wash your hands and prepare yourself and and so a lot of people are reaching for excuses or reaching for explanations because of fear um, some of it is because they really just want to know all of the details and I don't feel as though that from what I've read so far thus far is that they're scrambling um, at the CDC to try to work out a vaccine to try to work out different avenues of uh, medications and things to try to really research this uh, this virus to see how they can stop it in its tracks and right now it's just really out of control and you know like many viruses there are no cures However, they do have people working tirelessly and effortlessly to try to uh, make more improvements by studying and researching this particular virus to see how they can slow it down the best of their ability. And so it takes a lot of time and effort and they have tried to speed up the process as much as possible. But unfortunately, there are going to be more deaths. There are going to be more people that are affected by it and that probably will have to take medication and hang on in there until they discover something that will make things a lot easier for people all over. And so, too, there's a short of supply of vaccines and medications, and that's the other big issue that they had talked about. They, as in people who are concerned, had asked the White House and CDC what are they going to do about short supply of medication and so that's the other issue there's lots of questions lots of doubting that has been raised over this coronavirus and it is uh, really very valid fears and uh, valid doubts about the you know efforts that they're making are we as the U.S. prepared once this virus starts to really take its course in the U.S. and once we start seeing those numbers jump from just one death to maybe 200 or 2,000? Um, it's a possibility that we could be seeing that as well, just like in Wuhan. Um, so nobody knows. Uh, the other upside to that is that medicines in the U.S. are supposed to be a lot more uh, better in terms of quality and the medical uh, prof professionals are more um, ready, as they say, to combat these issues. But 
a lot of those doubts still linger because of the fact that people are using uh, social media to claim that it's a political hoax. They're persuading people to not believe that this virus is that serious, that it's exaggerated, and that it only targets a certain age group, or it is not really, really even a real issue. And so I found some things that I know that people might not have really thought about. Um, jails, schools, movie theaters, uh, venues. Those are large places where uh, large groups of people meet. And if this virus usually is dependent on a host, uh, which is human body and human contact, even if you don't touch a person, you're sitting next to the person, the person sneezes, you're using the bathrooms um, or behind another person. And so that raises the question of how quickly this virus spreads. It seems as though it spreads a lot, even when the person is not in the room and they've sneezed or they've left it on a countertop how long does this virus survive? And so that even brought up the issue, like I was saying, Lysol actually had on the back of the bottle that it kills coronavirus. But how, how, how effective is Lysol? How effective is bleach? Bleach kills mostly everything. Um, so how effective are these things? So can Lysol and Clorox kill the coronavirus? So that's an article in The Hill and so you have Clorox and Lysol wipes that may help keep the virus or coronavirus off surfaces, but they aren't the best way. And so a lot of people are wondering what kinds of household chemicals can they use to actually kill the virus if it, it lingers on the surface. I had heard that the virus can actually last on some surfaces if they're metal or steel for up to two hours. And that's with a person that's infected that is not even there in the room. If they sneeze or if they've left the, that virus on a countertop or a table or uh, somewhere where a lot of people frequent, then that virus can be on that, that surface for a period of um, time of two hours. So this article here, so I'm going to kind of go into a lot of this stuff because um, I don't think people really still even take it serious. They feel that it's an exaggerated type thing, and it isn't, because people want to know, because it's just, you know, for your own precaution and safety. So Clorox and Lysol wipes may help keep the coronavirus off surfaces, but they aren't the best way to protect yourself. So we have here... Um, in this article here, it's showing all of the different cleanser and, you know, antibacterial or antivirus or things that could kill things on surfaces, you know, such as viruses as these. So the photos that you see are Clorox brand products. They're on the shelf in supermarkets. We see them all over. So the novel coronavirus known as COVID-19 that originated in Wuhan, China has spread to more than 40 countries and affected 80,000 people worldwide. And so uh, that, to me, would qualify as a pandemic. So as the World Health Organization, which they call the WHO, in abbreviated terms, considered whether to declare the outbreak a pandemic disease prevention specialists are trying to find ways to slow the spread of this disease down. Okay, so the common household cleaners like bleach and products like Clorox, Lysol have been advertised as able to kill this virus, okay? So it is true that bleach will likely destroy the virus on the hard surfaces since it's been proven to do so with similar pathogens, but experts say the bigger threat of the contagion is person-to-person -person contact. So we can't drink bleach, we can't eat things that have bleach in it. So it bleach would be harmful inside of our bodies. But on a surface, to kill this virus may be effective, possibly. So 
Most of the times they say it's bleach that's a strong chemical and Lysol actually has something on the back of the strip that tells you that it kills coronavirus. And so, or at least it will help kill it from the surface surfaces in your home. So it's true that the bleach will likely destroy the virus on hard surfaces, as it says. So as the novel coronavirus continues to spread, the World Health Organization considers declaring a pandemic. Okay, finally, various contaminant strategies have been enlisted worldwide to slow this infection, the, from the quarantines to the common household cleaners. So the popular brands like Lysol and Clorox claim to have, this is what they say on the bottles, 99.9% .9 effectiveness against human coronavirus, according to the label. And I have seen it. I don't know if you guys paid attention, but when before this even became a thing of coronavirus, Lysol had this on the back of their labels, a list of virus things that it kills. And bleach just tells you 99.9% .9 of viruses and it kills things, like mostly everything. Um, so that probably is true, but it may not make much of a difference for protecting yourself and your loved ones, according to Dr. Sark. Um, Saskia Popsikul, a senior infection present, pre prevention epidemiologist, who works at the Phoenix-based healthcare system. So this is a pretty easy virus to kill, and it doesn't even live that long on surfaces anyways, okay? So that's what they say. Experts believe that bleach will likely kill this new coronavirus on the surface since it's worked on similar pathogens. So common household products like bleach and disinfectant, including Lysol, including the Lysol, and Clorox have been advertised to kill this virus. And while it's not 100% certain, like experts like Pop Pape Skew, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, generally believe, believes that this is to be true. So that's because coronavirus isn't new. Okay, so I'm going to let you hear that again. Coronavirus is not a new thing. But being so is that it all of a sudden spread, it's something that now feels new to us because we're hearing so much about people being affected by it. So the labels advertising the products as effective against it are referring to the previous known strains of this virus. So the current version, which arose in Wuhan late last year, is our new variation of it. So it's not completely okay guaranteed to react the same way to the disinfectant okay so that's what i fear in a way is that coronavirus if it's a virus viruses you can't kill and viruses have different strains so coronavirus the one that is on the lysol label says it kills coronavirus but which strain is that and so apparently we were not worrying about before all of this happened, this outbreak, we were not worrying about any coronavirus. We just, those of us that use the Lysol, we use it for like the bathroom or you use it for your countertops. You're not even really concerned about whether it kills coronavirus because you weren't even thinking about that. And nobody really looked at that to see, oh, wait, by the way, this cleanser kills coronavirus. But now we're looking at all of our leeches, all of our all of our antibacterial soaps, all of the different things that we use that are a lot even stronger chemicals to, to clean the bathroom and to clean places where many people frequent to see if this is effective. So as a similar virus is the new coronavirus, the new coronavirus that is, is what we're seeing, is particularly susceptible to cleaning products, she explained. It's known as an enveloped virus. Okay, which means it is wrapped in a lipid layer from the infected host cell, while the protective layer is supposed to help the virus survive. So it is easily comprised by uh, compromised by com compromised by disinfectants. So that means that it, it disinfectants that you have may possibly be enough to clear 
it away. So making this type of virus much easier to kill than non-enveloped varieties such as the norovirus. So I mean, a bleach-based disinfectant that's 100% is going to kill it very, very easily. Pop, uh, Pops skew said so bleach kills everything and i've heard this from doctors that bleach kills everything so this can be helpful for areas that come into contact with a lot of germs such as bathrooms public restrooms public eating places utensils now they would probably want to use bleach a lot more often than than you know and maybe up the the you know the the how would you say they might want to put a little more bleach in some of the uh when they're doing their dishwashing and or like fork spoons knives and things like that if you go to restaurants because people will reuse 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 things and you think that they're cleaning it really properly and sterilizing it. So it's important because not only the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, but what about, you know, like HIV, AIDS, that's, you know, even though they, they have medicines, there's a lot of germs, flu, colds, um, pneumonias. There's a lot of different germs out there that maybe even um, just as bad um, that are contagion and you need to like probably increase um, instead of a cap full maybe two caps full of bleach to parts of water uh, several parts of water and so even if the bleach and the other cleaning products do work as expected in killing the virus however they still may not be much help in slowing its spread down and so the truth is that the coronavirus has really poor survivability on surfaces, so that's good to know, but that doesn't mean that it's going to completely slow it down. So Pop, uh, Popescu uh, said, so the risk for transmission from spread through an inanimate objects or contaminated surfaces is low, but it's not completely zero but it is low. So the COVID-19, it's such still unclear to them. A recent study suggested that it may live, live on um, surfaces anywhere from now. This is where I want to tell you, so you don't think I'm making it up, that the recent study that they've had, that it may live on surfaces anywhere from, one, um, from two hours to nine days. Now that's actually a little more than I said two hours I told you two hours but nine days is pretty scary for a virus to live on a surface and um, just think in nine days how many people use public restrooms just think of in nine days how many people go to um, a restaurant and, and eat at the same tables and and use the same cutlery and utensils. Just think of in nine days how many people go into a clinic or a doctor's office and can possibly be exposed to this if somebody's sneezing and coughing and they don't properly wash their hands and they get droplets all over the seat and all over the doorknobs and what have you. Just have uh, that thought in your mind of how many people could come in contact behind another person in certain places where they released uh, bodily fluids and could possibly come in contact with this particular virus. So anytime you are using bleach, you have to be cognizant of those that might have respiratory and skin sensitivities to it, Popsky said. So the World Health Organization recently tweeted that it doesn't work to simply apply the bleach directly to your skin, which is probably dangerous, or otherwise directly introduce it into your body, which is extremely dangerous because now it's not a coronavirus that's going to be your issue. It's um, chemical poisoning to your skin and to your body so the world health Organization, is it safe to receive a letter or a package from china 
So people who may have family members or friends or receive, maybe you order something from Amazon. A lot of things that, a lot of products that we get may come from China. You have like clothing that says made in China. You have the certain objects, things that are in the 99 cent store that come from China. And it says made in China. And so is it safe? Those are surfaces. Those are things that might have the coronavirus on it. Those are some things that I wanted to bring out that I don't think people really thought about. So is it safe to receive letters and packages? So it says here that yes, it's safe. People receiving packages from China are not at risk of contracting the new coronavirus. The previous analysis, we know coronavirus did not survive long on objects such as letters or packages. And so that was a good question to ask. So does putting or eating sesame oil block that 2019 COVID virus from uh, entering your body. No, sesame oil is delicious, but it does not kill 2019 COVID virus. So no, it does not work. So does putting sesame um, oil or block on things block the new coronavirus from entering your body? So these are questions a lot of people have tried to find different solutions that could possibly help. Person-to-person -person infection is the biggest threat for the coronavirus outbreak. So most common cause of infection is which in the type of virus is close contact with people who are contagious, according to experts. Today, you know, there's a lot of people out on Saturday. They go to the movie theater. They go to theme parks. They go to big sporting events or maybe just big, huge, large events where there's large numbers of people. And so you don't know where everybody's been. You don't know everyone. So it says this is the organism that is generally spread through respiratory droplets, Hopsky said. So, so coughing, that cough, that sneeze, your hands can get contaminated and then you touch your eyes, your mouth and things like that. The best prevention tips are those that work against the common Contagion disease like flu is to wash your hands thoroughly and often as possible. Avoid touching your face and tell your friends and family to do the same. So it looks like the main driver is the widespread community infection is what it is. Dr. Bruce A. Aylward, a physician and public health expert with the World Health Organization previously told Business Insider it looks like it's a household level infection. And so... Those, I think, were good pieces of information because people want to know how they can try to protect themselves. They know that those of us know that we've probably used some of these products. You'd use them in schools. You use them in um, uh, restaurants. You use them in, in your house to try to kill viruses and germs so that you can protect your family, yourself, and who, um, loved ones and what have you. So, uh this one has to do with four ways to protect jails and prisons from coronavirus. And so public health agencies around the world are pre preparing for this COVID virus, the novel uh, coronavirus that has spread from China, Wuhan to multiple regions of the world. We now see more cases outside of China than inside of China. We're also hearing the the that of these cases inside the U.S. among people without known travel contact. Um, so one critical lesson from the experience with H1N1 a decade ago is the worth highlighting. We must integrate our nation's 5,000 jails, prisons, immigration detention centers with our pandemic response efforts. And so I don't think people really gave it a lot of thought that you have these people that are really susceptible to this virus because there's 5,000 jails, prisons, and immigration detention centers, which now are going to be vulnerable to this particular pandemic because of the crammed crowding of people in these close quarters. So in the spring of 2009, we are to 2009. We are also faced with a novel threat, or uh, the novel threat of health in 
the form of H1N1, which the CDC now estimates took between approximately 150,000 to 500,000 lives worldwide in the first 12 months of activity. So much of the illness occurred among young people who lacked antibodies for the strain of flu working inside. So remember that H1N1? Everybody was concerned somewhat. They, I feel like nobody really was as concerned as they are now about, you know, the coronavirus. We have more concern about that, but then we still have a lot of doubt because of the po political um, year that we're in where it's an election year and people are saying that they could possibly be using this as a conspiracy theory or a way to um, get more votes or to scare people in politics and what have you, or it's a hoax. You know, there's a lot of stories floating around. So much of this illness occurred with young people. and They lacked the antibodies for the strain, for this strain of flu. So that was the what was called once the H1N1, or the H1N1. So <clears throat> working inside the health service of the New York City jail system, we confronted a wide array of issues that were responding and responding to H1N1 from decisions about how to set up a surveillance for influenza-like illnesses to diagnose and treatment of suspected cases and isolation of housing areas, jails where people were ill. And so how would they go about quarantining prisoners when prisoners are already kind of set aside and they're confined to jails and, and beds and what have you, and then some are in close quarters or they share beds and share rooms and door like a, a, a jail cell with some other inmate. So one large advantage we had was that our health service was a division of the nation's preeminent public health department in New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So the decade or in that decade since I responded to the seasonal influenza, um, I guess it's pertussis or pertussis, or, uh, I may not be saying it correctly, it's this particular illness, and then uh, Legionella's and many other outbreaks, in other words, okay, um, other outbreaks within the correctional facilities, and so here are a few lessons that are critical for sheriffs, because now you have, like, the people who are workers in the jails that are also exposed to the inmates that are sick with this, they can also catch it as well. Commissioners and corrections and public health officials to consider. So, number one, COVID-19, when it arrives in the community, it will show up in jails and prisons. Very sure. It's showing up in schools and it will show up more in schools and children will be affected by it as well. And you, as long as you have parents that send their kids to school sick, with runny noses and they make excuses that they can't keep the kid home or take them to the doctor, it's going to be in the schools and other kids, kids that aren't sick are going to come in contact with this. So this has already happened in China, which has a lower rate of incarceration than the U.S. People in the U.S. are incarcerated at a rate of about 1 million times per month. And the number of staff who go to work, families who visit these places is even greater. So people who go visit their loved ones in prison, you're also exposing yourself to these viruses as well. So our efforts should focus on the reality of COVID-19 won't be kept out. That it won't be kept out, but we can manage the impact of the health behind bars. And so... The same goes for the courts, the judges, defense, attorneys, prosecution may limit court services or even close courts because what happens in courthouses and in, um, you know, buildings and, um, you know, government buildings, there's a lot of people that frequent them, they're coming from different places, and then you also have people who potentially might go to jail or have been in jail or come from out of the prisons, they're sick with this virus now, they're in court, they're sitting out there around lawyers, they're sitting around uh, where the, uh, the jurors are, they're sitting in close enough approximation of people that they can sneeze, they can cough, they, they can put things on surfaces from their hands, 
all these people can be affected. So it is affecting the quality of life for everyone. And so it doesn't limit who it affects. And so it's saying here that the number of staff who go to work, the families who visit these places are even greater and they're at greater risk as well. So our efforts should focus on the reality that COVID-19 won't be kept out, but we can manage the impact on health behind bars. The same goes for the courts, judges, defense attorneys, prosecution, our prosecutors may limit court services or even close those courts, but we dealt with this during the H1N1 when incarcerated people couldn't go to court. And so even when they had served their sentence and should have been able to go home, management of COVID-19 will likely result in school library closures and consideration should be underway concerning the number of people entering the jails and the prisons and how each step can re reevaluate and monitor. So one, the need for stabilization data collection requires including jails and prisons and health leaders. Most cities and states have a standard set of variables that will go on to a line list index or every suspected case of COVID-19 to track every one of those people through diagnosis, treatment, when indicated, quarantine, and release. So most jails and prisons are out of the loop when it comes to this process, and they must be included so that whether a person is in jail or in the community, this is vital information that can be gathered and care delivered. So jails and prisons need to have a plan in place to identify and house to gather people with suspected diagnosis of this coronavirus or this what is called here in the U.S. COVID-19. And so those who are at high risk of the serious illness if they become infected. So this includes people with chronic illnesses, those that are having compromised immune systems, pregnant women as well could possibly be infected. And this cohorting was extremely challenging during the H1N1. So we struggle to match up this public health approach with the operational demands of the jails, which generally house people based on several types of security classifications. In addition, when people are confined to a housing area of a jail or prison, there will be a tendency to keep them there without services and they are entitled to, that they're entitled to, and this will drive uh, conflict as time goes on. Communication to start now with the people most impacted by the issue, people who are incarcerated and their families, their staff, and the work in these settings, correctional settings around the nation are often run with tolerance for abuse and neglect of incarcerated people. So when public health workers drop into these settings during emergencies, they are often met with skepticism and suspicion by incarcerated people and correction staff alike. So only path, the only path to effective management of COVID-19 in these settings is meaningful partnership that starts now when plans are being de designed not two months or not uh, for, um, two months from now but n right now when the cases are being detected so covid-19 will remind us of the central hypocrisy in our approach to the health behind bars we've built the world's largest collection of jails and prisons and kept the health services in these places remarkably separate from the rest of our national health systems so the cdc states department of health and the joint commission and other bodies that promote evidence-based care in our hospitals, ambulatory care clinics, and nursing homes are largely absent in these settings as well. So as a result, management of these pandemics will be harder and less effective for incarcerated people, their families, and the staff in these situations. So, and in those institutions. So as we struggle to make a headway in the specific response, it should be reminding us that the goals of promoting health and addressing mass incarceration as well, both require that we finally connect these institutions to our community-based systems of health. And so 
This is by Dr. Homer Venters and the former chief medical officers of New York City's jail systems and president of the Community Oriented Correctional Health Services. And so I thought these were probably some good examples of some of the people that we probably least consider would be affected, but are probably uh, heavily at risk and greater at risk, in other words, for this type of thing to run rapid because they're in such close quarters and they probably have a limited access to vaccines and care in these settings. And this is not including just the people who are inmates, it's also the people who work closely alongside of institutions that house inmates. And so it puts a lot of people's lives at risk. And then I mentioned schools. So we have a high school that recently had a student that came down with the coronavirus. We had some university schools, colleges, where some students have come down with the coronavirus and tested positive. We also have children that are vulnerable. And pretty soon, and I hate to say this, early education, toddlers, babies, that could possibly come down with these types of virulent um, infections because what do babies do? Put things in their mouth. Other babies share toys, play with the, uh, objects in classrooms, put things in, in their mouth. They're mouthing a lot of things. And so this poses this huge risk because of this virus and I don't think they have considered all of the, the people that could really be heavily impacted by this once it's on the, the virus is, is running rapid and underway and so a lot of times too what happens when it's something that's a pandemic like this and there's a lot of fear it affects the economy and we're seeing that not only we're seeing that in the, uh, the stock market but the housing market we're also seeing the rates really low and then we're seeing where businesses are being affected where some people are closing businesses and then all of a sudden abruptly businesses are certain businesses are closing without explanation then we have some school closures that could possibly come into play libraries some other facilities that are frequently used by the community that could have some closures if they detect one or two people who might be infected with this virus and then they want to investigate how many other people could possibly have contracted it and spread it the uh, virus and so these are all issues that are very valid and very um, crucial to the livelihood of americans and people all over that live here and that go back and forth to their house to their families and so i don't think they really take into consideration how serious the seriousness of this so with that being said i'm gonna let this video go but what do you think do you think you will try to use these products a lot more readily than before because the you know i know that some people already use these products and it's just something that is a you know a natural thing so it you know it's it's the other thing I want to mention before I let this video go is I want to bring up this one other subject that I brought up before and I unfortunately I have to bring this up is coronavirus could hit the Bay Area homeless camps hard experts warn. So if they can hit the Bay Area homeless camps, they can hit the Los Angeles homeless uh, encampments, the beach encampments out by um, the beach the homeless encampments spread all over L.A. County, um, all up and down Vine and Hollywood. There's homeless encampments. There's homeless encampments everywhere, not just in the Bay Area. So I'm going to go into this and then I'm going to let this video go because I feel like the homeless will also be heavily impacted by this virus as well because of mental illness, not knowing who to talk to, being left out on the street. Um, having, you know, drug issues and then some of the people have pre-existing illnesses um, and they're just on the street left to die, um, that, that they're living in clusters, they're living in tents, they're living in squalid conditions that are unsanitary and that can also exacerbate this virus and make it 
more of an issue because a lot of those people are sitting in front of businesses or they come in contact with other people who are not homeless and they're asking them for change in the parking lots or at the gas stations and that's going to bring about more fear. Um, we already have people that are defending people who are homeless for um, being discriminated in, in some sense, but now it's going to be fear of people could possibly be infected with this virus because it's pretty much here in the U.S. and that these people, if they're not being cared for or they're not caring for themselves or clean, that they could possibly spread it by frequenting places where people are not really homeless and they have like at least somewhat of a fighting chance to try to keep themselves clean and here they come in contact with people that are, you know, not really bathing, they're not cleaning themselves, they're spitting on the sidewalk or they're coming into public establishments and then they're leaving all of the germs everywhere and so that makes it worse. So coronavirus could hit the Bay Area homeless camps and encampments very hard and so this is coming out and this is also an issue and um, this is uh, of great concern because we have uh, a huge homeless uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we've been talking about this for quite some time. There are a lot of people that don't have places to live and that, that's one issue. But now we have this virus which raises another concern. So as concerns about the coronavirus mount, the Bay Area experts are worrying about what will happen if the infection strikes the region most vulnerable residents, the homeless. So tent and RV encampments, the residents that tend to be packed very tightly together in unsanitary conditions could provide an ideal breeding ground for this COVID-19 virus sweeping the globe. Typically precautionary measures such as avoiding close contact with others, self isolating when you're sick and washing hands frequently are all but impossible in these encampments with no solid walls or running water. And so it's really an unsanitary situation. So what do these people do is the question that's being raised, which is very valid and very, very strong of a concern. Um, if they are infected, homeless people face a higher risk of getting very ill, very sick, with this disease, experts say, so they tend to be older and their immune systems are already maybe compromised by other chronic illnesses like drug and alcohol abuse and use and the harsh realities of street living as well is, is included in that. So it could become a major problem throughout of California, which not only has more confirmed cases of coronavirus than any other state, but also holds the nation's largest population of homeless residents as well. And the thousands of those unhoused people that are in the Bay Area right now. And, you know, Skid Row has spread out all over uh, LA County. And so I think we are all worried about it. So Dr. Margaret Cushill, the director of the UCF at, uh, a new CSF a Center for Vulnerable Populations at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. The worry has become more pronounced in recent days. The public has learned that a Solano County residents appear to be the nation's first coronavirus patient to contract the illness from an unknown source, amplifying concerns that the virus will start spreading within these states. And so, so far, the agencies and the nonprofits tasked with taking care of the Bay Area homeless people or encampments seem to be uh, watching, planning, and waiting, but have yet to reveal specifically policies to protect the unhoused people. So, a California Department of Public Health representative said that the agency is monitoring this situation so persons experiencing homeless are not likely to have any particular risk 
for COVID-19 related to international travel for exposure to recent travelers. A spokeswoman wrote in an email statement, but however, as the situation evolves, the California Department of Public Health and local health departments in California will engage with groups at risk of exposure and provide information on how people can be um, best protecting their health, okay? As soon as the CDC on Tuesday warned Americans that it's not a matter of if the coronavirus will spread, it will spread in the U.S., but when the Community Service Agency of the Mountain um, View in Los Angeles, or Los Altos, began working on a plan to protect its clients, staff, and volunteers. This is said by Executive Director Tom Myers. And so the agency provides aid to the homeless and low-income families and seniors, and Myers worries about the virus spreading through all of three of those populations as well. So his team's pre uh, uh, prevention plan, which he hopes have already or have uh, re he'll have it ready by Monday, may include precautions such as changing the way the agency operates at food pantries when they're passing out food to homeless people or when they're helping low-income people that may not have uh, adequate housing or they may not have adequate shelter, a service that draws hundreds of people every day, having lots of people in close contact with one another. Uh, workers might start don donning masks and gloves before handing food out, he said, and they might begin to pre-bag food and distribute it outside of the center to reduce the foot traffic through the building as well. So quite frankly, we feel like we need to be incredibly proactive on this and look at what is worst case scenario, Meyer said. So the staff at the Bay Area Community Service in Oakland based nonprofit is waiting for guidance from the public health sector, said Daniel Cooperman. Directors of Housing Strategies, it's obviously impacting the whole world at this point, he said. So it's something we've closely monitored and worried about. And so the Alameda County Public Health Department is considering the unique needs of our unhoused populations. Uh, spokeswoman Mitu Balram wrote in an email statement. So from our experience with previous outbreaks curbing, the spread of the disease is community efforts, and we will need the partnership of our cities and nonprofits. And so Ball Ram wrote this. And so we will share updated guidance with our partners as it becomes available, and we will work with them to safeguard all of our communities. So in Santa Clara County, the health department spokeswoman said that the agency is working with local service providers to make sure information about health recommendations and emergency notifications reach the homeless people or populations. And so for some experts, coronavirus brings a mind that hep um, brings to mind the hepatitis A outbreak that tore through California encampments in 2016 and 2017 as well was an, a huge issue. So after igniting the San Diego County, the disease in San Diego County, the disease which can spread through close personal contact or via food and drinks contaminated with small amounts of infected stool, traveled up and down the coast, sickening more than 700 people and killing 21, according to CDC. So Bay Area Community serve, Services quickly mobilized with county health care officials to vaccinate as many East Bay homeless residents as possible, and it worked. The outbreak largely missed the region, Cooperman said, so, but there's one big difference between coronavirus and hepatitis A. There's no vaccine for coronavirus. So, like I said, guys, there's no vaccine for viruses, and there's no cure for them. So, if the virus continues to spread, Crucial predicts that agencies will distribute hand sanitizers and install more hand washing stations in encampments. Hospitals also could lower their admission threshold, she said, accepting people who have no home to rest, recuperate, and self-quarantine, even if they have a minimal symptom. 
of this virus. So honestly, I think it's going to be very challenging, Kushal said. So Kushal also worries that the coronavirus outbreak will be dangerous in other ways for homeless people, even if they don't get sick. So my fear is, is that she says it is that this will be used as another way to further stigmatize an already stigmatized and challenged population. So like I was saying, people are, like I said earlier, that people are going to be afraid that if they come in contact with homeless people, that automatically they're going to assume these people are unclean, they don't have access to water and how to bathe themselves, they smell bad, they have urine all over them, feces, they might be sick with the coronavirus and they're coming in the stores, the restaurants, they're frequenting um, public places which you cannot stop people from going to public places. But if they're coming in contact with people who are clean to some degree and are taking baths and are doing what they can, be precautious. But here you come in contact with somebody who is living in squalid conditions and they, they, they reach out to you or either they sneeze on you or they cough on you or they spit somewhere or they maybe they use the restroom and now you use the restroom behind them that they've touched and now you could possibly get it. So it it poses as also that issue, you know, of people becoming more aggressively afraid and stigmatizing an already stigmatized population. So these are things that I thought were important things to bring out that I don't think that they've considered, you know, and, and we had a, like a big issue even in San Francisco. Um, I have known people who said that they lived there. They came right back. They said that living is really expensive and even people that make six figures find it uh, completely challenging to, to live in San Francisco. Um, sometimes they come back to Los Angeles because it's just too high. And it's starting to get like that everywhere. And Seattle has people living out of their cars and living out of their own vans. And so you have to cram your family in that because you can't afford the rents or the, the living. So um, which goes to say that this has a lot of work involved, this whole uh, coronavirus thing. So... Um, what are your thoughts on this issue? It's really scary because there's a lot of things that I don't think that they've really considered. You know, you've got the homeless population, you've got people who, you know, maybe living in hotels and motels and living out of an RV or they're living out of their cars or they're living with other family members and cramming themselves into a, a small apartments. Um, what about people like that? What about people that are incarcerated and they're crammed? you know, in jails and prisons and the workers that have to work alongside of people like that. And so I don't think they've considered all of these things. Schools where they have toddlers and babies mouthing toys. There's a lot of concerns with this. But with that having said that, I'm going to let this video go. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for listening. I appreciate it.